No, I think we're fine. All right, I think with that we can do we can go ahead and start. We'll just let uh more people join in as the call goes on. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joaquin Lapuz. I am the web content coordinator of the Humanities Across Borders program here at IES in Leiden. I'd, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this fourth session of our Academic Ontologies conversation series held every June and November since 2023. So this conversation session is co-hosted by the Humanities Across Borders and Fellowship Programs of the International Institute for Asian Studies or IES located here in Leiden. Before I give the floor to the two coordinators of these programs, I would just like to go over a few, a few rules and a few uh, the structure of today's session. So we will have our three speakers give 13 minute presentations on their perspective on filmmaking as research strategy, followed by a conversation between the three of them along one or two common themes slash provocations that emerge. And for uh, the chat box will be open all throughout the conversation. So please feel free to leave your comments and questions there and they will be read out at the end of the conversation during our open discussion. So. Now that we've gone over this, I'd, uh, I'd like to hand the floor over to the academic director of the HAB program, Arti Kalra. So Arti, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Joaquin. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Arti Kalra and together with my colleague, Lara and Joaquin, we've been organizing this academic ontology session. Uh, and I welcome you all. Um, just to give you an idea, Last summer, we focused on the uh, on the session that we did was on the practice of mapping as a strategy for community enmeshed research. For this session of academic ontologies, we will look up look at filmmaking and its broad applications for research. Film as a medium is deeply intertwined with storytelling and influenced by the history and cultural experiences of both the filmmaker and the audience. In this session, filmmaking is hinged around three vantage points. Uh, one, as resistance um, in the case of Indonesia, as we, we will see with one of the speakers, uh, as an archive for a moment in history of a particular linguistic community uh, and a linguistic public in India. And finally, an alternative space for knowledge production and pedagogy in China and Malaysia uh, as the third case. So um, our speakers uh, share how they use films as tools, not only to present and archive historical narratives, but also to provide a space for critical dialogue to challenge dominant narratives, including their capacity for manipulation and assertion. And finally also to view cinema for its capacity for solidarity building through engaged viewership. Uh, with that, I hand over the, the floor to uh, Lara uh, to introduce our participants and speakers. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining this conversation session. Um, yeah, I think uh, my colleague uh, Arthi and also Hakim, they have already introduced you a bit the idea behind this conversation sessions, which revolve around fundamental issues we refer to as academic ontologies. Uh, we will. I'm very glad today to uh, yeah to have a conversation amongst uh, three of our current uh, fellows at the institute. So I coordinate the fellowship program here at IAS, and uh, I must say that this cohort is very special for their passion for uh, cinema performance uh, film studies. And this is the case of the, the fellows, researchers who will be in conversation. Um, so Ling Zhang, she teaches at uh, the State University of New York. Uh, she's a researcher in the field of film studies, media, also sound studies. Uh, Sarah Niazi uh, teaches at Flame University in India. And uh, also, she's also a researcher in the field of film studies and history of cinema. 
Um, and uh, Rachel Thompson is an anthropologist and an artist, an independent researcher, also part of our current cohort. Um, they will maybe uh, let you know a little bit about their current projects, the, the research they are developing here at IAS uh, during their fellowship. But before we open up the floor for our speakers, um, I would like to read an excerpt from a poem by uh, Jean-Luc Godard, uh, maybe not the most original choice, but I think this fragment uh, speaks uh, a lot to what we will be discussing today. And uh, I would just let it resonate with us throughout the session. Um, the poem is maybe a bit an ontology of cinema as well. So I will read it. Um, cinema? The idea I can express right now is that it was the only way to tell, to become aware myself, that I have a story, a story of my own. But if not for cinema, I wouldn't know I have a story. It was the only way. Just a brief comment here. I think what he calls my story or my history, it changes, uh, I mean, uh, throughout the poem uh, between story and history. It's not necessarily his own biographical story, but rather the story of the world within which his life unfolds. So we can also understand, uh, yeah, history and stories are something essentially open and expansive, never closed off. Uh, continuous uh, transmissions and editing of lived and imagined uh, experiences. So I think, I mean, I choose this fragment because uh, keeping stories and history in motion is perhaps one of cinema's tasks. And in a way, this task uh, aligns with the task of the researcher. Uh, I will stop here and invite our speakers to the floor. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Arti, Joaquin, and Laura for putting this together and sort of inviting us, uh, Ling and Rachel and me, to reflect on uh, our own practice, but also on, you know, kind of broader question about um, academic ontology and thinking about film as research strategy. Uh, before I begin, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, also, I want to talk a little bit about myself and the project that I'm doing here at IIS. So I'm a film historian and I teach uh, film, uh, you know, film studies courses in uh, India. And uh, I come to IIS to sort of work on expanding some of these kind of, you know, questions that I had as a, uh, as an academic, as a as you know somebody who teaches film to students so the the question of pedagogy is very important um and so at IAS I am developing my postdoctoral project uh in thinking about uh you know the practice and the pedagogy of cinema in India uh, since the time of its sort of arrival in India. So I'm looking at how historically film was taught and what were the sort of institutionalization processes and the way in which film then becomes a kind of way of uh, storytelling, but also a way of producing knowledge. So that's the project that I'm uh, developing here. There are also many other things that I do, which in the interest of time, I won't go into. So, um, for today's presentation, I want to begin by introducing a few keywords. Um, and these keywords are sound, uh, politics, movement, and method. Uh, these keywords will resonate or record or act as sort of hyphens. Uh, which will join a series of ideas, themes, and my Ling and Rachel's conversation. Uh, some of these you may uh, recognize in their use uh, in sort of straightforward meanings, 
uh, and some have been used in more sort of complex ways, um, you know, by acad in academic vocabularies, um, you know, complicating their sort of etymological roots, as it were. So each pre presentation today will engage with these keywords, sound, politics, movement, and method in rather specific, but also in a sort of expanded way. This presentation that I'm giving today explores uh, filmmaking through the lens of the Urdu term film sazi. Uh, I'll go back to film sazi. Uh, and by examining uh, the nuances of this term, I want to highlight the intrinsic relationship between film, uh, filmmaking, historiography, pedagogy, and practice, and also to think about film as a kind of mode of knowledge production. Now in India in the 1920s, and this is the research that I've been doing, um, when I look at film and how it's been institutionalized um, as a kind of entertainment form, as a creative industry, or as an aesthetic mode in itself, uh, I found that there's a lot of discussion um, around this, you know, kind of idea of how to translocate a film which was seen as a kind of Western concept uh, to um, a South Asian milieu. So film enthusiasts, entrepreneurs, and writers turn to Indian languages to translate film concepts and theories. Um, and for such a purpose, the South Asian modern cosmopolitan language Urdu was mobilized to make available film theory to a growing cinephilic community in India. Now, Urdu writers, they experimented with a variety of terms to describe and translate the term, the English term filmmaking. And one such equivalence amongst many, uh, which was cr created by conjugating two words, which is film with SARS. And SARS can be translated uh, from Urdu to English to mean uh, creation. It signifies harmony and even refers to apparatus, and in this case, film apparatus. And that's important because we're thinking about the camera and how the camera could be used as a kind of potential medium to record or research. I'll talk about that more later. So this expands the contours of filmmaking, uh, you know, in this kind of Urdu iteration, I think, as something that is more than just creating or editing audiovisual material into a narrative logic. So in thinking about film and SARS together, the process then implies composition and producing or composing knowledge. So first, I want to turn to this notion of film sazi as a kind of creative process of knowledge production. And here I'm more specifically interested in thinking about how film and its archives allow us to access, narrativize, and memorialize the past. And as a historian, I'm very drawn to the archive of any form, but of course, the film archive is very, very, um, you know, uh, alluring as a place. So um, when we look at the earliest debates uh, about the complex ontologies of cinema itself, we find a kind of entangled discourse, which is, you know, kind of pushing us to think about verisimilitude. Uh, there's an emphasis on the reality effect um, mm -hmm. or the documentary value of cinema, the film as a kind of, you know, a record or a kind of document in itself. Uh, a British documentary filmmaker, Grierson, for instance, famously called the documentary as a creative treatment of actuality. But it's very complex, right? When we look at the early documentaries, they are so embroiled with the kind of processes of production and who makes these films and what were their sort of circulation also becomes important to think about. Now, let me give a few examples from the field um, of, uh, you know, film studies, but also historians that have used film archives in very sort of creative and interesting ways just to kind of open up uh, a sense of how film can be used as research. So scholar Ravi Vasudevan, for instance, has turned to official newsreels and documentaries in state archives to understand the types of information the films provide about political processes that went into the making of the partition of British India. Another very important film historian, Yamini Krishna, looks at the documentaries and newsreels produced in the princely states of Hyderabad. And she argues how the princely states were negotiating between technology, existing discourses, and social systems 
in our order to kind of counter the you know presence of empire cinema or the colonial gaze uh, produced in cities such as bombay calcutta and uh, other city other colonial cities now these are some examples of how film archives have been used to complicate existing scholarship on indian history colonialism uh, and the partition um and even in my work for instance i am very drawn to the archives um when i was looking at the history of early uh, you know cinema and its kind of present and the presence of women in the public sphere i was always kind of looking at all these you know early documents uh, with a lot of fascination but while these archives can provide access to the past um and we always think of the moving images as very seductive in a way but researchers also we are aware that we need to approach these archives with careful viewing uh, or reading and practice a kind of cautious consideration about their production framing points of view uh, the circuits of their circulation and also reception uh so it's important not to be seduced by these uh, ephemeral yet tangible quality that the moving image holds in itself now the second idea in my presentation i want to explore with regard to film sazi or film making are the contours or connotations related to rhythm and sound um in the late 1920s and 30s uh sound technology is introduced to indian cinema and the question of language becomes very important in a multilingual culture and though sound cinema of course has its own language and it borrows uh, quite uh, specifically from literary traditions from you know urdu to persian bengali marathi and even tamil uh, but the question you know the central question that occupied the contemporary filmmakers uh, in this period uh, was the question of language so what should be the language of an all indian you know cinema um, which kind of appeals to a very broad and diverse uh, constituency became really urgent in my work i turn to urdu archives uh, to find traces of um, these debates um, in popular print culture um and uh, urdu as a language uh, post independence has suffered immense neglect it has also been marginalized and some of these archival image uh, photos of the archives that i uh, you know had access to uh, reveal the kind of dilapidation and the neglect that these archives are facing um but these archives are important because they provide a kind of perspective on early film culture and the kind of debates that existed about film um similar work has been done by uh, you know film scholar ravi kant uh, and his works points to uh, the discourses in the hindi public sphere which uh, you know can be traced in um, you know other uh, magazines as well so Okay, I'm going to move very swiftly because I think I have very little time now. Uh, so when we look at the uh, films produced in the 1930s, and this is, I want to kind of look at some films. Uh, these are some magazines uh, from that period. Um, and the film that I want to really discuss and uh, is a Pukar, which is a film from 1939. It's a film directed by Sohrab Modi. Um, and this is interesting because it's one of the really popular genres from the 1930s and it's a historical film so it's a film that is trying to deal with history uh it's a film about the medieval period and revolves around the emperor jahangir's um you know this notion of justice uh the film addresses uh, contemporary communal tensions between hindus and muslims by negotiating these perceptions of the past and so the film actually um if uh you know i don't have too much time to give context but the film um is made at a time when the national movement is kind of growing uh parallelly there's also a strong growing uh, separatist movement uh and a kind of communal tension between hindus and muslims so through the film the filmmaker is negotiating all of these tensions but the story is embedded in a kind of medieval uh, imaginary or landscape so it's kind of interesting how all of these the past and the present are present are getting conflated in this film 
Uh, the film uh, set the precedent for historical films about Mughals uh, through a very specific use or mobilization of language in the film dialogues. And the film has some beautiful songs that are attributed to the writer Kamal Omrohi, who, um, you know, later makes this very beautiful film called uh, Pakiza, which is about, you know, courtesans and has beautiful Urdu ghazal. So the, the dialogues of the film were very carefully written in a kind of Persianized Urdu to represent the Mughal censorium uh, and its debates of uh, you know, justice and reform. And contemporary reviews that I accessed actually praised the film for its use of language and called it very accurate and historically precise. But uh, as historians, we know that this, uh, you know, the Mughal period, uh, the language, the official language of Mughals was Persian. So there's this kind of play with language and I think, uh, and playing with this idea of what is authentic. Um, so the dialogues and the lyrics of the film became very popular. They were memorialized in song booklets, which circulated as souvenirs long after the film was taken down from the single screen theaters. And the film's imaginary through the mise-en-scene, the kind of language, the costume, and a kind of continued investment in an Urdu imaginaire became a sort of template for films dealing with the Mughal censorium. And later, there are multiple examples. We can discuss those later. So now, finally, my last sort of engagement with this idea of pedagogy is what I want to come back to, is to think about uh, the film as a kind of pedagogical tool and to think about how we can use it as a way for uh, you know critical inquiry and to think of what kinds of theoretical methods are important now the relationship of film and to other disciplines is also something that we have to think about um, because that has contributed to a lot of shifts in the methods and the research strategies themselves so film studies itself, for instance, um, of course, has been an academic discipline for quite a while now. Um, it sort of starts off, I think, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, where it gains a lot of traction in the university. Um, but often uh, this was, uh, you know, kind of this happens where the film studies departments or the films, you know, are studied as part of more literature departments or language departments. And this practice, I think, even exists today. For instance, in India, uh, a lot of the film, uh, you know, courses are taught in humanities, broader humanities departments. So this association with older disciplines probably meant the migration of literary methodologies to film studies in the early periods. And so film as a text becomes very, very important. Um, later, we see the influence of psychoanalysis, for instance, in reading film texts, uh, and film becomes this kind of enclosed, uh, you know, uh, object of study. Uh, but more recently, we are seeing a kind of archival turn in films, uh, where the film archive has expanded, uh, not, you know, just the body of the film, but to look at, you know, production details, to look at film ephemera, magazines, um, and to look at, you know, the audiences, the theaters, and also the uh, exhibition practices and the circulation of some of these texts. Um, so last, uh, I just want to now conclude uh, to talk about how um, there is a kind of now shifting towards a kind of practice-led research model. Uh, I completed my PhD uh, at the Center of Research and Education in Arts and Media at CREAM, um, University of Westminster in London. And here they had a really fantastic uh, practice-based PhD program uh, where creative research becomes kind of increasingly recognized as part of the academic institution. Uh, and one is also thinking about how film can be thought of um, in terms of challenging more, uh, you know, traditional methods of exploration uh, and research in questions. So film then can expose, for instance, the geopolitical, social, cultural, and historical context. And such research, which is embedded with, you know, looking at film-centric research, allows for the exploration of the breaks and ruptures, embracing contradictions that may be difficult to articulate in more rigid theoretical frameworks and academic methods. So I'll end here, and perhaps we can have more questions later. Thank you.
So I believe the next person in our line is Rachel. So Rachel, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Rachel Thompson. Um, I'm an artist scholar working independently and currently a research fellow at IIS. And uh, due, some, due to some technical issues with my computer, uh, my presentation has been pre-recorded. So Joaquin, if you could uh, press play. Thank you. A Wider Weave, How Cinema Shows Up Once upon a time in a darkened cave some 30,000 years ago, shadow and light were cast at once. The animals, they say, appear in motion, at once before and after the flicker of flame. Could this be the beginning of a thing called art? We cannot know. Could these pictures, in and of motion, signal the advent of a cinematic realm? Around 1810, the word screen, once a piece of furniture for buffering the heat and spark of household fire, is transposed to an emerging scene, that of the magic lantern, where the word accrues new meaning as a flat vertical surface for the reception of projected images. Is this the beginning of a thing called cinema? Yes and no. Where should we draw the line? Where should we place the X to mark the spot of cinema's birth? In the end, point and line, and even plane, fail to configure, to sum up through geometric schema, the sensorial fields of force in which the soup of cinema swims. And by soup I mean a setting and a surrounds, a heterogeneous mix of differential bits. Not a broth, no, but a state fully subject to change, as solid as it is liquid, an aqueous sort of ground. And so, in lieu of questions of origin, or of final determination, I'd rather ask, from whence does cinema arrive? What dreams of prior forms find their fruition within its capacious surrounds? Today, with the supplanting of the big screen by myriad miniatures and never-ending streams, I wonder, and perhaps so do you, into what cracks and crevices of social life might cinema now go? In the minutes that remain, I'll trace a quick jaunt, a mere sketch, through the ways cinema shows up in my line of work, as an artist scholar operating at the outskirts of a place called academe. Before we tread any further, let's talk about text, about its origin as a woven thing. As the OED informs, text is a tissue, a texture, a web of weaving. Before text refers to the written, it emerges from the Latin word textere, to weave, to join, to fit together, to braid, fabricate, or otherwise build. And what we are building towards today, within this session, is the texture of enunciation and articulation beyond normative framings of text as word alone, wondering what cinema might afford. Part 1. People Don't Tell Stories Before I begin another story, let's query the roots of another word whose calcifications also deserve some form of dissolve. Method is a path, a way, a hodos, a manner of traveling along. If we tear it in two, we find a pursuit, a quest, a searching after, along a traveling path. Through this opening up of method, I find an aperture, a point of entry onto the tale of how a practice of improvisational composition carried me from the realm of music to the meta-hodos of essayistic cinema. And now, a true story posed as question. What is one to do when conversation with a close confidant takes leave of itself and veers into the oncoming lane of long-silenced horror? What is one to do when the refrain, people don't tell stories, instantiates an affirmative negation, marking the start of yet another story of personal experiences of political violence, at once told and untold? One must listen as much to the words as to their constitutive betweens, the gaps, fissures, aspirations, and laughs that neither belong in the mouth of another nor find their fruition on the printed page. One must chart a different course, wherein strategies oblique, direct, and circumlocutive are brought to bear without guarantee. One must attune to the inextricable nexus of politics, ethics, and aesthetics, or at least that's what I felt the imperative to be, to find another way of doing, again without guarantee. When the time came to present this early work in an academic forum, these forays into the orality of history with Sumarsam, a Javanese musician, theorist, puppeteer, and professor who had long accompanied my traversal of a winding inquisitive path, the only thing to do, the only way to body forth, 
What had transpired between us was to configure a performance in kind, to rupture the artificiality of academic monologue through sonic discursive dialogic play. No explanation, no outside to the performance. Instead, a conjuring, letting his disembodied acousmatic voice flood the scene and set the stage, configuring myself as the responsive yet secondary dialogic interlocutor. I was a prompt to, but crucially not the teller of, these untold stories long interred. Years later, after finding my way to film, I had occasion to circle back, to channel what had long been percolating, about Indonesia, its unfinished revolution, and the counter-revolutionary violence of 1965 that tore the country asunder as it stitched together another sort of body politic under the ever-present thumb of military dictatorship. The result was a rather queer film compelled by an essayistic impulse, that roving, ruminative, shape-shifting drive that forever multiplies its points of entry and exit onto the material at hand. Extinction Number 6 took as its topic an eccentric, unnamed narrator's quixotic search for the material traces of Java's colonial, mystical, and paleontological past a journey haunted in equal measure by the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora on the island of Sumbawa and the still murky events of the 1965 Indonesian coup d'etat and subsequent anti-communist massacres. The hodos through which the film assembled did not emerge from a vacuum, but rather in relation to a myriad melange of prior literary, sonic, and cinematic work. Today, I only have time to briefly touch upon two sources of inspiration. Part 2. Cup of Gas Filmmaking and Speaking Nearby In 1977, after tearing up his MBA diploma and returning to his roots in theater, Kidla Tahimik completes his first film. Perfumed Nightmare is an uproarious, semi-autobiographical fable of a young Filipino's passage from enchantment to disillusionment an ultimate declaration of independence from the cloying strictures of colonialism's old and new, a patchworked cinematic document of joyous revolt. In an essay a decade later, Tahimik likens the process of filmmaking to the taking of a long trip. The film Voyager can load up with a full tank and bring a credit card along to ensure completion in as short a time as possible. The Voyager can also load up with a few cups of gas and drive until he runs out and scrounge around for subsequent cups of gas to get to his destination without worrying how long it takes. To free himself from the straitjacket of Hollywood norms and other people's money, Tahimik opts for the inefficiency of an open road full of detours and explorable nooks, wherein time is converted from adversary to co-director of the creative process. One of his latest works, a filmic essay crafted over the span of 40 years, reimagines the tale of Magellan's global circumnavigation, placing Enrique of Malacca, Ferdinand's slave, as the rightful claimant of first person to circle the world and return home to tell the tale. Five years after release of Tahimik's perfumed nightmare, Trinti Min Ha, born in Vietnam, completes her fil first film, Reassemblage, while living and working in Senegal. At the outset of the film, which begins in darkness and the fullness of sound, Trin states the following. Scarcely 20 years were enough to make two billion people define themselves as underdeveloped, a line that recurs near the end of the 39-minute film. A moment later, she declares, I do not intend to speak about, just speak nearby, before sound and image erupt into cacophonous, contrapuntal motion. What is at work in this ethic of adjacency? This refusal to speak about, as political as it is aesthetic, is a refusal of and a challenge to the finite and the fixed. Speaking nearby comes to serve as a fundamental animating impulse of Trin's wider body of work, encompassing poetry, film, musical composition, and a strand of theoretical work that cannot be divorced from literary endeavor. Within the book Cinema Interval, a collection of interviews with the artist-scholar, she speaks again on the nature of the nearby. It's a speaking that does not objectify, does not point to an object as if it is distant from the speaking subject or absent from the speaking place. A speaking that reflects on itself and can come very close to a subject without seizing or claiming it. 
the speaking in brief, whose closures are only moments of transition opening up to other moments of transition. These are forms of indirectness well understood by anyone in tune with poetic language. In her preface to the book, Trin writes of an expansive notion of interval that meets up with my own transit from music to word and onwards towards cinema. For Trin, interval opens onto a relation of infinity assumed in works that accept the risks of spacing and take in the field of free resonances, or of indefinite substitutions within the closure of a finite work. After a detour through Ziga Vertov's theory of intervals and the role of intervals in the making of music, she arrives at a locus betwixt the worlds of logos and mythos, where lunar light has the quiet power to transform sleep time into awakening time. From metamorphoses to metamorphoses, shadows to shadows, one is led as the night mutates to one's sudden encounter with one's own abyssal light. In this no state of intense altered consciousness, one finds oneself being of both, of here and there, knowingly knowing not. Part 3. Aqueous Ground Barely a breath left to tell of where I now tarry, lingering in this zone of knowingly knowing not, within a world of conjunction and contestation that appears to play out like a film. Anchored in the present, yet with a view to the long durée, my current work queries the role of simulacral spectacle in animating scenes of political struggle in Indonesia, the Netherlands, and the enduring entanglements between. Centered on a massive, symbolically charged project of hydroengineering, designed for Indonesia by the Netherlands, this research examines a constellation of mediatized theatrical scenes of social, ecological, and political contestation with roots in the colonial and authoritarian past. Scenes which include the televised mass eviction of an urban village along Jakarta's flooded coast, sandwiched between a 13th century port and the city's last remaining Dutch East Indies Company warehouses. A polemical election crossed with a blasphemy trial invoking nativist rhetorics of blood and soil, redolent of the racialized categories of the colonial order. The storming of an artificial island slated for luxury real estate by a flotilla of displaced fishers whose waters the new land usurped. A viralized eco-spiritual protest against a transnational cement company's evisceration of a sacred mountain range wherein female farmers succeeded in seeking audience with the president after transforming themselves into sculptural amalgams of woman concrete wood. A lurching long march protest from Bandung to Jakarta by workers laid off from the state oil company, who, riffing on scenes from 1980s horror films, dressed themselves up as zombies to dramatize the dire conditions of their former employ. A double raid on the National Legal Aid Institute, aiming to silence the ostensible ghosts of the 1965 anti-communist massacres, who would not stop singing of a rice paddy waterweed. A quadrilingual lawsuit conducted via video link between a courthouse in Den Haag and a cafe in North Sulawesi, adjudicating Dutch violence during the Indonesian Revolution, some 70 years after the fact. Through focus on the complex dramaturgy of each scene, I examine the ways in which the past presses on the present and the material fuses with the symbolic to uncanny simulacral and spectral effect. Taken together, these scenes of chronotopic instability and material symbolic morass reveal the uncertain stakes of the nation as an iterative, contestational project ever in need of reconfiguration and renewal. Thank you, Rachel. So uh, from here, we'll transition now to Ling. So Ling, please take it away. Okay. Can you see the full screen? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Archie, Shokin, and uh, Laura, and uh, I look forward to uh, more discussion. And I really enjoyed uh, Sarah and Rachel's presentations. Uh, so my presentation is, um, yeah, I'm trying to incorporate uh, film studies also with media, for instance, radio. How do we discuss film in relation to other audiovisual media forms? Um, <clears throat> so in his uh, autobiography, uh, African-American revolutionary 
Malcolm X. Oh, how to? Okay. Um, he vividly recalls in his 1964 visit to Ghana, West Africa. So he wrote, uh, Chinese ambassador, Mr. Huang Hua, gave a state dinner in my honor. The guests included the Cuban and the, the Algerian ambassadors. And also it was there that I met Mrs. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Three films were shown. One, a color film depicted the People's Republic of China in celebration of its 14th anniversary. Prominently shown in, his, in this film was the militant former North Carolina African-American Robert Williams. The second film focused upon the Chinese people's support for the Afro-African, Afro-American struggle. Chairman Mao Zedong was shown delivering his statement of that support. And the final film was a dramatic presentation of the Algerian revolution. The dramatic presentation Malcolm X mentions might have been Egyptian filmmaker uh, Yosef Shaheen's um, Jamala the Algerian, uh, made in 1958, an anti-colonial fiction film dubbed into Chinese and screened in China, or An Yielding Algeria, a militant documentary by Beijing's um, Xinying Central Studio Newsreel production. Regardless of the film's identity, this account um, illuminates an alternative media circulation network during the Cold War, distinct from the profit-driven cinema in capitalist systems. First, it reveals how both fiction and documentary films served as vehicles for political thought and practice, fostering transcultural understanding and advancing cultural diplomacy. Second, it emphasized the transnational trajectories of these films, traveling from China to Ghana, engaging African, Cuban, and African-American audiences. Finally, Malcolm X's account situates this event as the, the so-called periphery of the global South, where exiled North American political activists intersected with global anti-colonial movements. This convergence reflects a shared political vision and tri-continental solidarity uniting Africans, African-Americans, Latin Americans, and the Chinese during the Cold War. The transcultural journeys Malcolm X recounts, along with their broader historical, cultural, and political uh, resonances, form the foundation of my presentation, Acoustic Internationalism in Solidarity Media Network in China, Malaya, and Algeria. This talk is part of my book project, um, tentatively titled, uh, Sounding Wayward Journeys, Traveling Films and Media in China and the World, 1949 to 1989. This project underscores the significance of cultural diplomacy during the Cold War by tracing the transnational circulation of media through a sound studies perspective. It explores films and other media forms with travel motifs by Chinese and international filmmakers, examining the complex transmission of sounds, images, and ideas across local, national, regional, and global contexts. Central to this study are the translation, dubbing, exhibition, and critique of films from Asia, Africa, and Latin America screened in China during the period. Given the People's Republic of China's limited diplomatic relations with most Western nations until 1971, the book accentuates the emergence of people's diplomacy, an official yet institutionally supported forms of cultural exchange. Films, art exhibitions, literary translations, radio broadcasts, and performing arts served as vital platforms under state socialism in 1950s to 80s China, advancing solidarity network across the global South. Um, yeah, of course, of course, later we can discuss uh, how 
should we differentiate uh, the terms, uh, uh, for instance, global south or third world or tri-continental? The project also underscores the ephemeral yet powerful role of sound, singing voices, music, and collective roars transmitted through media infrastructures and technologies such as radio stations, recording industries, and dubbing studios. This sounds transcended cultural, linguistic, and geopolitical boundaries, fostering connections among the, the immersive power of audiovisual media. This presentation explores the circulation of film sound and acoustic culture between socialist China, Southeast Asia, and North Africa during the Cold War, facilitated by radio broadcasting and documentary filmmaking. This media mobilities, supported by socialist infrastructures and solidarity networks, such as state-owned film studios, progressive film festivals, for instance, the Asia Africa Film Festival, or Carol Vivari uh, Film Festival in, in Czech Republic, and the conferences, for instance, of Afro-Asian Writers Conference, charted alternative uh, pathways to the profit-driven commercial film industry, promoting anti-colonial and anti-imperialist solidarity across the Third World. In the early 1960s, China as an emergent socialist state cultivated reciprocal uh, relationships with newly independent African nations, particularly in uh, West, North, and East Africa, inspired by the abundant uh, spirit and the shared commitment to anti-colonial struggles. These collaborations extended across diverse sphere, including agriculture, industry, infrastructure, healthcare, and cultural exchanges. And the central to these efforts were documentaries produced by the Central Studio of Newsreel Production in China, which documented Third World Solidarity and served as a powerful facilitators of people's diplomacy. For instance, between 1960 and 1976, um, seeing this studio produced more than 100 films, documentary films and newsreels, including The Horn of uh, Africa, uh, 1961, a Chinese Somalian co production that won the top award at the first African Film Festival in Somalia. And yielding Algeria, 1963, uh, that won the top award at the second African Film Festival. Um, others include traveling in Ghana, visiting Guinea, Premier Zhou Enlai, visit West Africa, and uh, Tanzania and Zambia railway under construction. Despite this, uh, their historical, cultural, and political significance, this rich Sino-African legacy remains underexplored. This, this presentation examines uh, pivotal sonic practices, okay, such as the Malayan Communist Party's radio station in China, 1969 to 1981, and the voiceover narration in documentaries such as Unyielding Algeria. These examples of acoustic internationalism reveal how Cold War sonic and media circulations shaped global political imaginaries and the continuous contemporary discourses on transnational uh, activism and cultural diplomacy. Um, I don't have much time, but I want to show you about 30 seconds of this uh, documentary from Yielding Algeria. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess okay. we stop here. Uh, move on. Uh, oh, no, it's okay. You can play it. I was asking if there was audio. Oh, you didn't hear the audio. Yeah, yeah, I didn't hear the audio. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the audio didn't work. Uh, okay, it's then. Okay, it's okay. So it's, now let's move on. Uh, to the case study of the voice of Malayan revolution. Um. So it's a radio station. Uh, during Taiwan's martial law period in the 1970s, a Malayan student was arrested by a secret police for covertly listening to the voice of Malayan revolution. 
a clandestine broadcast by the Malayan Communist Party that operated from 1969 to 1981. Um, so those are books uh, about this station and the radio uh, Jacqueline already played in the beginning of the, um, the conversation. So I won't play the, um, the clip. By 1976, the VMR's vigorous interval signal symbolized the resurgence of morale among M MCP guerrilla fighters. These fighters in Malay and Thailand border regions would gather to listen, joining strength and solidarity from its broadcast despite the constant adversities and threats they faced. Contrary to earlier assumptions that station the station operated near the MCP's border headquarters. Recent oral histories, memoirs, and studies revealed um, it, its location within a confidential unit in uh, Yiyang City, Hunan Province, the People's Republic of China, during its 12-year operation. The M VMR narrative not only underscores the surging revolutionary movements in East and Southeast Asia during the Cold War, but more, more reveals the dialectic tension between the ethereal boundary defying radio waves and the material and the infrastructure constraints of station locales and resources. So these are the um, research, um, so these are the books written by um, Malayan Communist Party member and writers and uh, um, the memoir by the um, secretary of the uh, Malayan Commun uh, uh, Communist Party. So this uh, presentation uh, examines the VMR as a case study uh, uh, to explore radio's role as an auditory medium that provided disembodied voices and facilitated acoustic internationalism. Radio transcends linguistic, ethnic, and national barriers, creating intimate emotional and intellectual connections within ways dispersed listeners. VMR promoted trans-ethnic solidarity through class identification, propagating anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist socialist ideals. It challenged, it challenged the Malaysian uh, official label of MCP as a predominantly Chinese party, resonating with Chinese um, urban workers, Malay and Orang Asli indigenous peasants. The history of VMR encapsulates pivotal shifts in Cold War geopolitics in East and Southeast Asia. This dynamics encompasses domestic contacts in the PRC, Malaysia, and Singapore, regional interactions involving Thailand, Vietnam, Burma, and Cambodia, and international tensions among the UK, the US, and Soviet Union. And this research provides a fresh approach on Cold War era radio, challenging Euro-American centric and uh, um, ideologically conservative perspective. So they said the scholarship on uh, European American radio, focusing on material aspects such as station location, record, uh, resource allocation, and technology demanding infrastructure. The study situates radio broadcasting in broader Cold War conflicts, including the conflicts between socialist and capitalist camps and intra-socialist tensions among so-called um, fraternal parties in Asia following the Sino-Soviet split of the early 1960s. Uh, radio broadcasting emerged in the early uh, the 20th century as a transformative medium characterized by its so-called a phantom-like character in Fanon's words, capable of transmitting information across vast distances through electromagnetic waves, its oral format, and accessibility to the masses bypassed liter uh, literacy barriers. Beyond its role in education and entertainment, radio became a powerful tool in psychological sound wave warfare, particularly during World War II anti-colonial struggles and the Cold War. 
a revolutionary thinker from uh, Franz Fanon highlighted highlighted radio's power in his essay. This is the voice of Algeria, illustrating how how the secret stations such as the voice of a fighting Algeria broadcasting from neighboring countries such as Tunisia uh, unified and inspired Algerians during their fight for the, for independence from French uh, colonial rule. Um, so if you have seen the film Battle of Algiers, uh, you remember the radio in the film. Okay. Uh, similar to the VMR, which began broadcast on November 15, 1969, bridged the psychological and ge uh, geographical distances between the exiled MCP and their comrades and supporters across Southeast Asia. A diverse staff of 100 comprising multi-ethnic Malayan revolutionaries, Chinese, Malay, and Indians from different regions of Southeast Asia, worked in tandem with Chinese technicians to write, translate, edit, and broadcast the station's multilingual programs, broadcasting in Mandarin, Malay, English, and Tamil. Responding to requests from Chinese communities in Southeast Asia, VMR later incorporated Chinese dialects such as Hokkien, Hakka, Taichu, Cantonese, and Hainanese. By the early 1970s, leftist parties in Malaysia and uh, Singapore actively promoted VMR schedules and wavelengths, reprinting transcripts in underground newspapers and uh, pamphlets. VMR operated until uh, June 30th, 1981, when it was shut down under Deng Xiaoping's directive, marking China's shift toward neoliberal economic reform and opening up. This decision was pressured by Singapore's then Prime Minister Li Kuan Yew, who demanded that uh, China stop supporting communist armed struggles in Southeast Asia. The closure symbolized a geopolitical um, period away from revolutionary solidarity. In closing, I offer a brief coda to encourage reflection on the progressive potential of contemporary audiovisual mass media and the digital platforms such as podcast and YouTube, uh, YouTube, TikTok, alongside the enduring legacies of film and radio. How might this historical uh, pre precedence inform our global imaginary of justice and solidarity, harnessing the power of uh, the light and small media formats to resist dehumanizing violence and oppressions in all its forms? More Moreover, how can cinema media studies become a transformative site of knowledge production when rooted in a commitment to social justice, equity, uh, equity and the affirmation of our shared humanity? Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, Ling. So, uh, and thank you to Sarah and Rachel. So now we'll have them take over and have a conversation amongst themselves, uh, discussing some of the common themes of the conversation. So please take it away, whoever wants to start. So maybe I had like something that I prepared. <laughs> maybe I'll start. Uh, so... I think uh, thank you, Ling and Rachel, for such rich presentations. And, uh, um, you know, there's so much um, kind of similarities and overlaps between our uh, sort of mediations on, uh, you know, the practice of filmmaking. I really sort of started thinking about, um, you know, more and more about the contemporary media landscape. Um, you know, we encounter or we are saturated with images all the time. Moving images are, you know, coming to us in this kind of chaotic, frenetic, very accelerated ways. Um, also, the access to, uh, you know, technology becoming more cheaper, for instance, means that, you know, we have uh, more and more people creatively using film. Um, and I'm just trying to think about what are the sort of robust critical practices that we can think about in such a kind of, uh, you know, cluttered media space. Um, and maybe, you know, we can just speak to that a little bit about how we could think about a kind of critically engaged media practice in this very, you know, 
digital age that is, you know, also wired by AI and um, all kinds of social media platforms, uh, which can also turn into these echo chambers in some way. Linda, first? No, 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 please go ahead. No, you, you. No, no, uh, please, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, part of what I am interested in is this expansive and expanded notion of cinema. So at once, beyond the cinematech and even beyond the screen, um, you know, thinking fundamentally by invoking the Chauvet caves, you know, to just think about not only images that move, but to think about, um, you know, what is it of a sort of human apperception and analysis of this movement in the world that then became transcribed, you know, through these cave paintings and etchings that were sort of putting back together um, a sense of movement uh, previously analyzed, but occurring in the world. And so I think, you know, it was such a rushed and swift attempt to kind of uh, show everyone the, the broad range of scenes that I was looking at. Um, but I guess what's important to say is that while I began with one kind of singular project that in many ways, and I'll just invoke one example of it, but this massive, um, you know, Garuda-shaped, seawall was sort of imagined by its progenitors as something that returning diasporic Indonesians would see in movement as they descended from the airplane. So it's like reconfiguring even, you know, we're, we're accustomed, I guess, to thinking about uh, the windscreen of uh, a car or a moving vehicle, you know, a terrestrial moving vehicle as sort of almost desensitizing us to this other kind of movement. Um, but what I found, you know, my interest was to sort of study how this, this mega project that was so charged uh, symbolically and had all kinds of pressings of the past. And I have a question later for you, Sara, um, about what the film that you brought up that connects with that thematic. Um, but what I witnessed was, was that there was such a sort of proliferation of, you know, one of the largest mega cities in the world of everyone you know, most people, you know, more people have cell phones than have toilets, we know, in the world. And so, you know, in this political landscape that in Indonesia is still very much dealing with the legacy of, of 32 years of authoritarian rule, you know, while one may not be able to kind of make change in terms of electoral politics, I observed an incredible form of sort of... Uh, what I almost want to call moving away from notions, sort of Euro-American or Greco-European, and I say that sort of invoking the sense in which Europe claims Greece um, as its progenitor, um, but moving away from notions of art and aesthetics to, to forms of social poiesis, forms of social making that are in and of themselves, coming back to your question, Sarah, of a critical praxis that's attempting to do something um, and, yeah, I just became fascinated with the way in which it's not simply, you know, a sort of weapon of the week in terms of memification of other things, but actually the realm of sort of political battle is happening around different forms of spectacle making um, that are both there to be observed in real life and to be conscripted into uh, the movement through social media. Um, so maybe I'll leave off there and, and pass it over to Ling. Okay, thank you uh, for the interesting questions and comments. Um, I want to talk about uh, accessibility. So how do we understand accessibility in different layers? For instance, um, first of all, the um, accessibility of the infrastructure and digital technology. Uh, um, now we have less access accessibility of uh, phones, uh, smartphones and uh, digital platforms. Um, um, more affordable, more accessible, 
Uh, but on the other hand, it also more fragmentary and atomized. And for instance, in my cases, all those uh, culture uh, exchanges, cinematic exchanges were highly um, institutionalized. Um, uh, but now, uh, of course, it's decentralized, but uh, it can't. So how do we understand this level of uh, accessibility in relation to pedagogy? And the uh, second layer of accessibility, I think, is the storytelling, uh, the way of storytelling and cinematic style and even genres. As uh, Sarah mentioned in another, uh, on another occasion, for instance, uh, the Indian filmmakers they made social melodrama as a more popular form more accessible form to the masses. Um, because when we talk about literacy, it's not just uh, uh, li literal literacy, it's also audiovisual literacy. So uh, if this is in conflict with altruistic, uh, highly creative uh, cinematic um, uh, techniques and uh, styles, um, so how to negotiate this uh, uh, mass appeal um, uh, to convey political messages and this uh, um, stylistic creativity. And of course, the language barriers can be uh, another uh, yeah, another layer of accessibility with uh, uh, either dubbing or subtitling or, or um, yeah, other means of uh, uh, communication. Uh, I don't know who wants to respond. Uh, I think these are all very interesting sort of observations and points that you're making because, um, you know, this comes to, uh, I'm just thinking about, you know, this idea of accessibility and uh, pedagogy, as Ling mentioned, because we are all, I mean, at least I teach film as well. So for me, it's always a question about, you know, how do we start teaching film uh, in the academia or even people who then maybe don't stay in the academic environment but go out to make films. So people who are learning filmmaking, for instance, and then the question about how to read aesthetic forms or, you know, uh, as, you know, Rachel, you mentioned, like, you know, to look at movement in general, to look at the sort of, you know, way in which it pervades these kind of um, uh, media infrastructures and also media formats. And in a previous conversation, I know we talked about like this kind of genre, which is kind of very closed off as a form. And perhaps uh, to look at the presence of cinema or the cinematic as a category um, uh, in its very ontology, you know, kind of pervasive in other fractured ways in in you know in reality in life in general right so I think that to me is very sort of important to think about as well of how we think about the circulation of uh, you know the the spectacle the cinematic as a spectacle and if that spectacle or the cinematic can actually circulate in far more intermedial ways than we know of uh, and I think uh, Ling's Rich, uh, and Rachel, both your work, to me at least, you know, speaks of that intermediality um, very strongly, and it suggests that kind of, you know, movement of um, of these sort of ways of resistance uh, in 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 very sharp ways through the intermedial networks, uh, which I kind of find very interesting. I can maybe just speak to one example on that last point of yours, Sarah. Um, so one of the most potent forms of protest, you know, I showed a very quick version of these seven different scenes, but one of the most potent um, was these women who came to be known as the Nine Cartinis of Kandang, um, who, you know, after, after failure to stop um, the evisceration of their mountain by a transnational cement company, fighting it at, at the scene in central Java, you know, came to the capital, um, to a site that faces the presidential palace, ostensibly, you know, to address the president, seek audience with him. For most uh, protests, it's merely, you know, you're across several lanes of traffic and, you know, you're lucky if you get the nightly news to sort of record your message. But there was something so incredibly iconic about their um, figuration, I want to say, of, of this, you know, living death, you know, that the zombies later, later picked up on. But it was like, what if we can't grow rice anymore because our mountain 
that, that filters all our water and feeds our water has been destroyed to make concrete. And so this kind of almost automatic gesture of let's put our feet inside of wooden boxes with room just for our toes to stick out, pouring wet cement so that they became these kind of living sculptures and would stay that way for 72 hours. They would have to be cared for, you know, by other people would have to lift them up when they were finally invited into the presidential palace. It was on, you know, push carts. And so all of this, you know, served as incredible dramatization that then got picked up all around the country and all around the world. So even domestic Indonesian, you know, Indonesian women working as domestic labor abroad on their weekends, um, they didn't have access to cement, but they cr crushed up newspaper and got cardboard boxes and, you know, mimicked the imagery. The same iconicity, and here's where I'll end, has been picked up in different theatrical productions, operatic productions, along with memes. So it was really this incredible, iconic, uh, you know, I want to say thing without words. One didn't need words to, to dramatize the stakes of what was happening there. And I guess, yeah, I'm very interested in this sort of citizen political work with iconicity um, that maybe doesn't start in realms of quote unquote high art, but ends up traveling there. So I'll stop off there. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I think that's why we uh, study film and filmmaking and media, not only as text or um, uh, author's work, but also as um, events, as encounters, um, as yeah, highly uh, mobile. As, uh, and as in Rachel's case, a, a, so cinema does not only, does not only only transcend the boundary of a medium as a film, but also transcending the boundary between fictionalized or uh, technologically mediated imagery, audiovisual media, and the social reality, the social life, and as part of us restaging, uh, yeah, like zombies, and as a, a as kind of a social protest and the resistance. So it's not only transmedial, but uh, transcending the boundary between the medium and the social reality. So this interaction is really, uh, really interesting and highly dynamic. So I had uh, two separate questions, one for Ling and one for Sara. Um, I'll pose them both and then and then hand it over. So for Sada, I was really interested in the one film that you brought up today, but I'm thinking about it in relation to other films you've spoken of, where some kind of historical theme is almost being mobilized to, in a sense, work through something in the political present. And I was wondering, um, I know I've heard you speak about this historically, um, so I'd be interested in that as well, but sort of pushing towards the present, I'm curious if you could speak to what might be happening today um, within cinema across the subcontinent that is engaged in, in similar kind of gestures to almost make claims on historical or mythological narratives for political purposes in the present. Um, and then for Ling, my question, you actually began to address it in your conclusion, but I'd be curious to hear more um, I know that you focus, you know, specifically on this era of Cold War solidarities, but I'm curious what you may be observing today in the present that might be in some way, I don't know, receiving energies from the sort of tail fumes of the 60s in a way to sort of fuel contemporary solidarity movements, you know, against imperialisms old and new. So thank you, Rachel, for that question. Um, I mean, this is, I think, what is very interesting about cinema, um, also the kind of cinema that's produced in Bombay, um, historically, you know, has kind of really this very interesting engagement with the present and with the political as well. So uh, I didn't have time to talk about it, but, um, you know, I, I 
I wanted to talk a little bit about the social melodramas, for instance, which uh, Ling also pointed to. Um, and these films, you know, in the 1930s and 40s are really sort of engaging with contemporary issues of reform and, you know, the transformation of society. And they are bringing their own contemporary, you know, codes of morality and uh, frameworks into these narratives. And through that sort of negotiating the, the kind of turmoil that is unfolding in terms of so social reform needs. Um, one of the central arguments of my work is to think about how the Urdu archive is sort of reflecting on some of these questions. And I look at uh, some of the writers who, uh, you know, review these films and they frame it within a kind of, um, you know, there's, there's a term called akhlaq, which is can be translated to, um, you know, ethics and morality and so they always talk about this ethics and morality which is coming from a larger sort of uh, you know urdu uh, milieu uh, borrowing both from you know the islamicate as well as you know other indian traditions so uh, it's in these of me social melodramas are infused with that sort of you know negotiating uh, you know the complexities of what is ethical morality um, and what are the social needs um, that need to be sort of, um, you know, worked upon. When we come to today, I think the nexus again between commercial cinema and, uh, you know, the Bombay film is very much, uh, uh, sorry, the Bombay film and the, you know, the broader political uh, landscape is very much intertwined. Uh, we see a kind of, you know, a like a huge number of films being produced in India that are attempting to um, rewrite or reintervene into, you know, historical narratives. Um, there are multiple number of mythological films being produced that are from the larger pantheon uh, of, you know, the Hindutva project. So there is a kind of interesting way in which cinema is being kind of mobilized to tell this narrative, this new narrative of um, the political right in India today. Uh, and it's happening at two levels. One is that the mythological films are being made, and these are again kind of, you know, looked as more as historicals. Uh, but there are also more contemporary uh, events, you know, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, certain kinds of natural calamities or disasters that have been re-looked uh, through this kind of communal perspective, through this kind of perspective of political rights, um, you know, manifestos and negotiations with, you know, the, the 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 present circumstance. So I think there is again a reworking of uh, the alignments between the, you know, political right in India and the commercial Bombay industry. Uh, and there's a very kind of close way in which. Uh, there is a rewriting of these um, historical projects. And the earlier, the Mughal sensorium that I was talking about from Pukar is actually completely, uh, you know, upturned, for instance. So today, the Mughal Empire, the medieval period is being looked at with a lot of hostility in a broader, you know, public sphere. And that seeps through in the kind of narratives that are being made. So more recently, the kind of films that are made, like Padmavat, for instance, um, uh, you know, shows these uh, Muslim rulers and uh, characters as barbaric, um, you know, violent, and, you know, the, it's kind of borrowing on these kind of Islamophobic tropes, um, which are now seeping into these, uh, these more commercial, huge, uh, big budgeted films. Uh, so there is a kind of I think political agenda there as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for your inspiring question, Richo. And um, I've been following the contemporary media phenomenon about mainly about uh, the Chinese African community. Uh, for instance, um, there's large African communities. Uh, yeah, large African communities in China, in Guangzhou and in Zhejiang, Yiwu. And uh, there are some documentaries and uh, that's, 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 cool. that's yeah, that, uh, some filmmakers uh, uh, have been making documentaries and and uh, fiction films about these uh, communities in in China, and uh, in very popular online streaming short video platform. 
there's an African woman called Rose uh, who marries a Chinese man, and she she became she became a kind of a internet celebrity uh, nowadays in China. But of course, it also kind of capitalized uh, this uh, uh, this celebrity culture. And on the other hand, there are different uh, Chinese communities in different African countries. There, there are also some uh, films. Uh, so, so in my observation, um, so in China, the contemporary discourse is quite complex. On on the one hand, after the nineteen eighties, after the kind of neoliberal reform. Um, I think many people in China adopted a kind of a social Darwinist uh, ideology, even from uh, borrowed from Western colonialism. Uh, some some have a racist attitude toward African population. But on the other hand, uh, more and more young people are trying to rediscover, um, to re-educate themselves uh, about this uh, socialist uh, um, uh, third world solidarity with um, um, African country people and uh, Latin American people, uh, so different discourses and uh, they they are in debates and in conflicts. Um, um, but of course, it's um, I also see more young generation scholars are doing this this kind of research. The the Sino African um, exchanges in in business in in, in economy political yeah, different uh, different aspects, um, but uh, I think how the historical legacies inform our contemporary understanding to enrich our contemporary understanding of this uh, relations, not just uh, international relations uh, or from politicians' perspective, is very important. Um, and uh, I also have a question for Rachel. Uh, I found your presentation very, uh, very poet, poetic, very essayistic, and especially the moments, the interval moments with your voice and speaking over dark screen. Um, so I'm also wondering how do you incorporate your creative uh, impulse as an artist with um, kind of academic research um, on this issue. I, I know RT also wants to say something, but I will stop here. Thank you. Yes, uh, if I can jump in really quickly. So I guess we can answer this question and then we have to open it up to everyone else. So yeah, so go ahead. Um, I'll just speak very briefly uh, so that we can open it up. Um, but the work um, that I was pursuing for my doctorate in anthropology emerged directly out of that film extinction number six um, that I mentioned. So um, how do I say this? Sorry, I'm just trying to think of a way to say this swiftly. Um, I would say that the impulse, all of the impulses um, of the film, the film became this kind of extinction number six, which is a two and a half hour long film that in many ways, when I made it in 2009, 2010, had been percolating for 10 years. Um, and now everything that I've been doing sort of in the past 10 years almost took the film, which is incredibly dense as this package and sort of exploded it back up. Um, and in many ways, I see what I'm working on right now is making another kind of package of all of these things um, that will then carry me, you know, for my next decade of work. Um, and I think um, just to end, what I became so interested in was sort of disabusing myself of notions of the artist and filmmaker and actually really looking at practices on the ground that if one were to take um you know a sort of macro common denominator seem to be operating according to very similar principles um and so i'll just stop there so that we can open things up or hand it over to arti yeah i just wanted to read read out a question that was very pertinent to uh, all that you have been saying uh, by Ming Yi 
uh, uh, Ming Yu Li, uh, <clears throat> who asks, can the study of, a of the film archive serve as a methodology or just as a case study to add some bonus to non-media social scientific studies? So I think what each one of you have said in many ways speaks to this question. So perhaps this would be a very good way to also perhaps end this uh, session because we go back to methodology and to the question of social and uh, science research and also humanistic research. So to, you, to uh, anybody who would like to respond. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting question and a question that I think um, you're always sort of um, working through in some ways, like at least I am, um, as somebody who is interested in history, as somebody who is really embedded in thinking about, um, you know, the social cultural history of India and how does then film become a part of that? Is it this is sort of kind of speaks to that. Um, in, in addition to that, like some of the examples that I gave, for instance, these are people who are like Ravi Vasudevan, for instance, is looking at, um, you know, uh, like the research question is probably uh, exploring partition, um, you know, and the sort of aftermath or the sort of, sorry, the making of partition, not the aftermath, but how the partition sort of was uh, happened in India. And that was probably the research question. And he's using film as a way of sort of unpacking uh, this question. So I think the mm -hmm. film archive, um, it depends really on how or what your research question is. Uh, and in that sense, it can then take you to different ways of approaching uh, the archive. Um, there are cinematic ways of looking at the archive, for instance, to look at perhaps the, um, you know, I mean, I talked about the archival uh, turn in film itself, where the film archive um, was sort of expanded to include materials from, you know, other archives, paper archives, for instance, uh, literary archives. So again, I think in the broader, you know, social uh, scientific studies, we could think Think about expanding, um, you know, those archives to include the film as part of the, you know, an inquiry. So I think really it's about what kinds of questions you are asking in the research and where they take you. Uh, for instance, if you are, uh, you know, if somebody is researching about, um, you know, the storytelling as a tradition, practice-based media, for instance, uh, practice-based research would lead you to, for instance, make your own. Uh, you know, um, you know, experiment with different kinds of storytelling methods, and as ways of creating, uh, you know, these uh, st stories yourselves, and then sort of researching. So I think it's very important to think about what is the question that is sort of driving the project, and through that, perhaps a uh, film archive is sort of uh, a, an interesting entry point um, into those questions. Okay, I will briefly follow up. Um, uh, so now, um, I think films can also be treated as an uh, archive, but of course, it's very tricky. So on the one hand, um, for instance, historians show um, fiction films or documentaries to students because those films provide um, concrete details about certain history or aspect of life or culture. Uh, so give uh, give um, people who have not experienced that historical period a, a concrete sense what that period uh, uh, looked like. Uh, but on the other hand, I have read some uh, historians, uh, they treated fiction films as historical documents. Uh, it's, it's really not uh, uh, accurate because we know uh, fiction, especially fiction films, even documentaries, uh, a, uh, those have been through uh, creative process procedures, right? Those uh, mediated and selected and um, changed by um, 
by cinematic creation. So I think we have to be careful on the one hand, treat films as archives. On the other hand, we cannot um, treat them as precise historical uh, documents. Okay, I will end here. Okay, uh, I think for the sake of time and because you don't see uh, many more questions that we haven't touched on already, I think we will conclude it there. So thank you very much, Link, Sarah, and Rachel, for taking the time to talk with us about films research strategy. Thank you, Laura and RT, for coming together to help put this conversation up. And thank you to our lovely audience for coming in, sitting down and listening to the conversation, um, sharing some of your own questions. Um, this this conversation session will is recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube at a later date. So all of our participants, you'll receive something in the mail afterwards. And uh, if you are interested in any of the other academic ontology series, then please go check out the IAS.Asia website or our IAS YouTube channel, and you can see the other conversation sessions we've had there. So storytelling, uh, place-based belonging, mapping, and of course, this filmmaking as research strategy. So with that, thank you very much again, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Okay, thank you. <laughs>